As fast as the wind and as powerful as a hurricane, Audi's new TT RS is the sporty spearhead of the TT series. Its look has gotten sharper and a bit more aggressive, fittingly because the TT RS has a new, more powerful five-cylinder turbo engine. A seven-speed dual-clutch transmission distributes the power to all four wheels. In Grunde our car tester, Matis Kurat, says the interior is pretty much like a normal TT's, but the start-stop button and the drive-select button to choose the driving mode are found on the steering wheel. And in the center console, where a regular TT has its start-stop button, the TT RS has a button that can shift the sound of the muffler from normal to sporty. The biggest change that Matas notes is the newly developed five-cylinder engine under the hood. It weighs less, yet boasts more power than its predecessor. Audi's engineers have shaved 26 kilos off the new engine alone, and that improves the car's dynamics. This Roadster accelerates from 0 to 100 in just 3.9 seconds. Top speed is normally capped at 250 kilometers per hour, but can be raised at 280 kilometers an hour on request. A paddle on the steering wheel allows the driver to shift manually. But Matis says the transmission is so well-tuned, especially in sport mode, that you'd hardly ever need the manual shift. But he says you need to be careful. The powerful motor and good handling can tempt you to drive too fast on country roads. Matas is testing the TTRS near Madrid, not far from the 3.5-kilometer Saquito de Harama race course with its 13 curves. The RS and Audi TT RS stands for racing sport. Matas says that's why he's come to the Harama circuit, where in the 1970s and 80s, Formula One giants like Niki Lauda, James Hunt, and Gilles Villeneuve had their great successes. To test the car on the track, Matis trades the Roadster for the second body variant, the Coupe. That has two advantages. First, he can see how well the Coupe performs as a race car, and second, he can compare the Roadster and the Coupe directly. From 0 to 103.7 seconds, the TT Coupe has never been this fast before. The new five-cylinder engine produces 294 kilowatts of power, 44 more than its predecessor. Torque is a whopping 480 newton meters. A traction control system ensures maximum acceleration with a minimum of slippage. Especially on curves as tight as here on the racetrack, says Montes, you notice how broad the area is in which the engine delivers the maximum torque of 480 newton meters. He's quite impressed with how well and how fast he comes out of the curves. Of course, you have to be careful not to accelerate too much, he says. Depending on the curve, the car's rear could swing out too much, so you have to take care. But if you haven't completely deactivated the ESP, it keeps things under control, slowing the car in plenty of time, but not too soon. The car has the typical sound of a five-cylinder engine and two oval exhaust tailpipes. New Matrix OLED taillights with a 3D design are eye-catchers. This is the first time they've been part of a standard Audi.
The Audi TT RS costs around 70,000 euros. Mata says there's no denying you'll notice the difference from supercars like the Porsche 911 Turbo or Honda NSX, which deliver even greater performance on the track. But for a car in this price class, the Audi is very powerful indeed, thanks to its permanent all-wheel drive. The coupe performs better than the roadster on the racetrack, says Matas. First, it accelerates a tad faster. But more importantly, its roof is more torsion resistant, which lets you reach greater speeds in the curves. But since he regards the TTRS as a car mainly made for fun, and since he rarely drives on a racetrack, Mata says he'd choose the Roadster version. In Germany, the price for the coupe starts at just over 66,000 euros. The Roadster will set you back around 3,000 euros more. What does the average man or woman want in a sporty car? It should have plenty of power, yet not be a gas guzzler. And it ought to be fairly roomy, too. The Peugeot 308 GT is one of the more affordable entries in this category. Our car test, Emmanuel Schaefer, says potential 308 GT drivers have four basic options. They must consider whether they want the 1.6-liter gasoline engine or the 2-liter diesel, like the one he's testing. They also need to choose if they want to drive a sedan or a station wagon, like this. The diesel we're testing generates 133 kilowatts of power. This allows the Peugeot to accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 8.6 seconds and achieve a top speed of 218 kilometers per hour. Unlike the gasoline version, the diesel is only offered with a six-speed automatic transmission and start-stop technology. Peugeot's lion emblem graces the radiator grille in classy chrome, along with a small GT logo. All the lights are LEDs. Under the hood, the two-liter diesel produces a maximum 400 newton meters of torque. Seen from the side, the sloping roof line gives the station wagon an elegant look. And the 18-inch alloy wheels come as standard with the 308 GT station wagon. Emmanuel says the back seat's roomy enough. There's space to put his hands between his knees and the front seat back. The seat bench itself feels a little hard, so it's not suitable for really long trips. But all in all, it's okay. The wraparound taillights improve visibility. The Peugeot and GT logos, as well as the dual chrome exhaust tips, are all real eye catchers. The trunk offers 610 liters of luggage space, or 1,660 liters with the rear seat bench folded down. Emmanuel is immediately struck by the fact that the steering wheel is relatively small and has a sporty feel. Unlike most other vehicles where you can see through the steering wheel, the opening here is quite small, so the instrument panel is located above it. Many functions are controlled via touchscreen. The sat-nav, Music, media and radio, vehicle data, parking assist, etc. The air conditioning can too, which is why there are no buttons down here, so it looks tidy. Prices for the Peugeot 308 GT station wagon with the gasoline engine start at just over 31,000 euros in Germany. The sporty wagon has a fairly stiff suspension, which sometimes makes for a bit of a rough ride. However, it also rewards a more active driving style.
Emmanuel says the sport button's down here in the center console, and when he presses it, certain things change. For one, the instrument panel changes color to red, and then in the middle, it shows him current data, the torque, turbocharger status, and so on. The sound changes too, though it's only audible in the interior. Loudspeakers pump up the volume of the engine noise, though only in here, not outside. Well, the Peugeot 308 GT station wagon has sporty ambitions. It can't quite match the power of comparable vehicles from Audi or VW. But the Peugeot's the clear winner as far as cargo volume goes, offering buyers at least 20% more luggage space than the competition. Renault has sold 13 million Clio since the model was launched 25 years ago. Now the current generation has undergone a bit of a facelift that includes a redesigned radiator grill. The engines range in power from 54 kilowatts in the entry-level models up to 162 kilowatts. The new Clio has been selling at German dealerships since September at a starting price of just under 13,000 euros. Mercedes AMG is expanding its product portfolio by the GLC 43 Formatic Coupe. This dynamic model combines an elegant sporty design with the brand's hallmark driving performance and the advantages of an SUV. The 3-liter V6 twin-turbo engine, the 9G Tronic automatic transmission, and the AMG Performance 4-matic all-wheel drive with its rear bias ensure an agile on-road drive. This year, Hanover was the venue for fans of commercial vehicles, large and small. More than 150,000 visitors to the IAA trade show got to see 332 world premieres in the segment. The focus of Volkswagen's presentation, the Crafter. Up to now, the model was based on the Mercedes-Benz Sprinter, but now underneath the skin, it's VW through and through. The van has a larger payload, bigger cargo volume, optimized external measurements, and the best drag coefficient in its class. Volkswagen's Eckhard Scholz says a vehicle's beauty is not really the decisive factor. What counts is functionality, utility, cost, and providing customers with a tool for the particular application they want. For even more individually tailored solutions, Opel has been working closely with well-known specialists. The German car maker's assortment of special purpose vehicles ranges from several campers. to new cooling systems. Vans for people with limited mobility. And special vehicles for police, firefighting, and rescue services. With its Vivaro Sport, Opel proves that elegant design is not out of place in a commercial vehicle. The Vivaro Sport is available in passenger van, cargo van, and double cab versions with a choice of two different body lengths. Automotive supplier ZF is also working on making commercial vehicles more like cars. CEO Stefan Zoma says ZF would like to transfer all the technology from cars to commercial vehicles. The company is well positioned in both segments, he says, but he does see some gaps, for example, in braking systems, and ZF is doing its best to close them. Alongside driver assist, another technology that is increasingly moving from cars into commercial vehicles is electric drive. One of the latest examples is the VW eCrafter, which can drive 200 kilometers emissions free. The only problem is it can't go faster than 80 kilometers an hour. Mercedes-Benz is celebrating the debut of its urban e-truck. 
The all-electric model also has a range of around 200 kilometers and an impressive 12.8 ton payload capacity. Sven Ennest of Daimler Trucks calls bringing all-electric drive into the conventional segment the biggest challenge. The urban e-truck is meant for deliveries in metropolitan areas, and there the big challenges are achieving keeping emissions and noise levels down. The urban e-truck looks suitable for areas outside cities as well. That makes it very variable not least due to the fact that a special technology gives it a charging time of just two hours. In urban areas, its noiseless electric drive benefits residents, and this truck will have no problem with low emission zones or diesel bans in cities. Anna says that advances in battery technology have ushered in a new era. For him, the improvements in energy density and costs mean the time is ripe for a truck in this segment. He says, we can expect to see these trucks on the roads at the start of the next decade. Toyota's new ProAce Verso MPV now has more to offer. The van is not only available in two versions, it also comes in three different body lengths, ranging between 4.6 and 5.3 meters. Car tester Andre Zimmermann praises the interior, which he says meets passenger car standards. He has a slight beef with the position of the bottle holders, though. Their dashboard location means he has to lean forward to reach them. He says putting them in the door would have been more practical. One very practical aspect is the relatively slender body width of 1.92. With a turning circle of 11 meters, this vehicle is highly maneuverable in city traffic. The Toyota's front is reminiscent of its German rivals from VW and Mercedes. The compact version we tested has eight seats and is 4.6 meters long with a wheelbase of 2.9 meters. That makes the Proes Verso the shortest van in its segment. Andre says a ride in the back is an experience worth having. Not only do passengers have room in all directions, but the design concept includes large windows. His favorite feature is the panoramic roof, making a drive around the city a real sightseeing tour. The driver's seat is definitely not that of a typical van. The Toyota Pro Ace van has 110 kilowatts of power, giving it a maximum speed of 170 kilometers an hour. The sprint from 0 to 100 takes 11 seconds. The vehicle consumes an average of 5.3 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. Andre describes the Proes Verso as easy to maneuver, with effortless steering, but he finds the gearbox action a bit rough. Shifting could be smoother as far as he's concerned, but it's precise. Light vans are becoming more and more popular on the European market, and the Proes can rival the best of them. Andre says the three body lengths and the choice of station wagon or platform cab versions mean the Pro Ace is poaching not only in VW's T6 hunting grounds, but also taking on the smaller VW Caddy as well. At heights of less than 1.9 meters, the Pro Ace is no problem for underground or multi-story garages. And the low price makes it a real alternative to the leading brands. The Mercedes SL class generation that debuted in 1963 had a tough act to follow. These models had to be sporty, but elegant, comfortable, yet fast, with that typical Mercedes-Benz quality and reliability. The 280 SL was all that and more, and today, as a classic car, it still is. It acquired the nickname Pagoda for its concave hardtop. 
Mercedes-Benz presented its new SL series at the Geneva International Motor Show as the successor to both the legendary 300 SL and the 190 SL. Known internally by its chassis code W113, it was no domesticated race car, but more of a sporty two-seater for everyday use. Over the eight years the series was produced, there were three different models. First, the 230 SL, then the 250 SL interim model, and ultimately this one, the 280 SL. The 280's 170 horsepower carried it past the magic 200 kilometer an hour mark. The Pagoda was a hit, especially in the United States. More than half the cars produced were sold to America. The ladies were also charmed by this easy to handle roadster. Another reason for its appeal was the new design language. The W113 heralded the demise of the Baroque contours of its Mercedes forerunners and the advent of sportier masculine lines, while preserving Mercedes' typically genteel elegance. Its look was thoroughly modern, but not trendy. The hardtop was standard on every SL. The roof's nickname, Pagoda, quickly evolved into a term of endearment for the whole car. In 1963, the new Mercedes drew a lot of attention. A young French designer, Paul Brac, created the new look and Mercedes design language for the decade to come. Mercedes expert Malte Dringenberg explains that Paul Brock went for graceful lines, and what he designed was very nearly a small car compared with the model's predecessors, the 300 SL and the 190 SL Roadsters. The 280 SL is a very compact vehicle, but has its own unique style that's light and breezy. With the top up or down, the convertible cut a good figure. Its interior sacrificed none of Mercedes' trademark opulence and comfort. The optional four-speed automatic transmission proved very popular with buyers. The original car in the series, the SL230, featured a 150 horsepower direct injection engine. For a Mercedes, that was a very sporty, high revving motor. Even if Mercedes gave these SL models a hint of sportiness, nowadays connoisseurs appreciate the Pagoda more for leisurely drives and outings in the country. Now a Pagoda in good condition will fetch at least 60,000 euros. The later 280s were the best engineered. Malta Dringenberg says engine performance is comparable with all the different SL versions, the 230, the 250, and this 280. They were all fitted with six-cylinder engines that were refined over the years, but he feels there's not a huge difference. The 280 SL Pagoda may not have been as exciting as its Italian and American competitors, but it was robust and reliable, just what you'd expect from a Mercedes.